Um, so hello everyone, um, I'm Bruno O'Brien. I'm the Executive Director of the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility or ACCR. Um, uh, welcome to this uh, BHP uh, briefing tonight or, or uh, this morning, wherever, wherever you are in the world. Um, uh, we are really thrilled uh, to be joined by uh, my colleague Dan Gosha um, and a couple of external presenters who I'll introduce in a moment. But first, I would like to uh, say that I am uh, joining you from the lands of the uh, Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation in uh, Eastern Sydney in Australia um, and acknowledge uh, the elders uh, past, present and emerging of, of those nations from, from which I, I join you. Um, and, and pay my respects. Um, and to acknowledge that um, uh, with every uh, presentation that we do, with every all of the work that ACCR does, we're all always joining you from unceded um, Aboriginal land, um, and especially relevant to the topics that we'll be covering in this webinar. Um, so uh, thank you again uh, for joining us. Um, so my colleague, Dan Gosher, ACCR's Director of Climate and Environment is also joining us. Um, we are delighted to be joined by uh, Cato Muir, who is one of the co-chairs of the uh, First Nations Heritage Protection Alliance um, and the deputy chair of the National Native Title Council in Australia. He's a traditional owner from the desert and goldfields lands of Western Australia um, and an anthropologist and archaeologist. So we are absolutely thrilled to have Cato's expertise on the call and, and he'll introduce himself more fully in, in a moment. Um, we're also joined by Edward Collins, uh, Director of Influence Map and Independent Think Tank that evaluates uh, uh, lobbying activities done by companies and their industry associations around the world. So uh, we have a, a very full uh, program for um, uh, this evening or this morning uh, and um, uh, we, we absolutely uh, welcome you. We hope this will be interactive. Um, we are recording um, this webinar. We don't plan to uh, kind of um, necessarily uh, publish it in full on uh, the uh, web. However, we might use little bits and pieces of it. Um, if you, we will have an opportunity for Q&A. Um, and if you do wish for your name to uh, be anonymous, please use the anonymous uh, chat function on, on the Q&A as you're asking your questions. Uh, so I will um, just uh, kind of set, set the uh, program out. Dan, if you wouldn't mind um, just putting up the introductory slide. So we'll take about, um, I think about 30, 35 minutes uh, for, um, so we've got two resolutions to BHP, of course, we've got one on cultural heritage um, in the wake of the, of, of Rio Tinto's uh, detonation of the um, very uh, special cultural heritage sites in, in, um, at Duke and Gorge in, in the Pilbara. Um, and uh, Cato will, uh, will present to us on that and we will have some uh, time for Q&A. Um, then we will hear from Ed on industry associations in Australia um, and we'll have time, of course, for a discussion of the two shareholder resolutions. Um, so without further introduction, Cato, perhaps I'll, I'll hand over to you um, to give us a, 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 your insights into cultural heritage um, protection um, or not uh, in, in Western Australia. Thanks so much. Yeah, good. Thank you. Bryn, and uh, I'll start by acknowledging the uh, First Nations across Australia um, in the various uh, territories. I myself am resident in my traditional lands uh, uh, in a town called Leonora, which is basically north of Kalgoorlie for anyone who is familiar with uh, Western Australia. And yeah, so I'm basically. Uh, my background, as Bryn has uh, indicated, I formally trained as an anthropologist and archaeologist. I also do work in linguistics, uh, predominantly in Aboriginal cultural heritage space, as well as uh, native title and, uh, you know, land rights. So, yeah, and acknowledging uh, everyone present on this, uh, on this call. So thank you all for taking the time. Um, so yeah, Aboriginal cultural heritage uh, 
and I'm assuming uh, there may not be a, um, a strong background in understanding uh, Aboriginal cultural matters, but essentially um, Aboriginal culture uh, is grounded, and particularly in the desert region, but uh, predominantly around Australia, is grounded in the concept of the dreaming or the dream time. Um, the dreaming or Tjogorba is a um, series of events of, uh, of creation. So it's the, it's the moments of creation, um, better translated as dreaming as opposed to dream time, because it uh, reflects the ongoing nature of uh, this spiritual connection that people have. Now, Aboriginal culture is defined around a series of interwoven relationships. Um, and these relationships are mediated through the concepts of the dreaming, but they're also, um, that they extend out to embrace landscapes. So the image behind me is a, a image of a landscape, um, which is part of a dreaming site, uh, which is then connected to the Seven Sisters dreaming. So the Pallades constellation, which travels across the sky. So in Aboriginal conceptions of uh, landscape, um, spirituality, and then physical um, representations of that in, in the land, uh, there are multiple levels of interrelationships. Now, in a mining uh, scenario, um, and I did this by accident, but it just uh, occurs to me also that the landscape featured in the background there is scheduled for extraction and uh, destruction through, uh, you know, mining for iron ore. Uh, and you see the red tinge to the dirt is uh, basically the presence of iron oxides. Um, this basically there's there's no uh, bones about it. A mining project is extracting uh, extracting metals or minerals from a landscape and the landscape in which those minerals have settled over millennia. And what um, what often coincides is the fact that Aboriginal spiritual connections are also reflected in in that same landscape. So it's uh, no accident that sometimes uh, significant deposits, significant geological features also uh, connect up to Aboriginal uh, understanding of the landscape and, and the spiritual connections. So more often than not, there's always this, uh, you know, a, an effect where from an Aboriginal perspective and the interactions with, uh, you know, the settler state uh, that is Australia and the industry that comes with it, um, there's this uh, constant uh, struggle against the loss of landscape, the dispossession from lands and uh, the marginalisation from economic uh, means. And in that process, uh, basically, there's an accumulative uh, series of losses. So in the Pilbara region with Jukun uh, Gorge, um, effectively, the, the legal framework was established in such a way that it was legal. Uh, everything that Rio did was legal. Um, they got their approvals, they got the, um, uh, the, the consent, which was uh, not so much consent, but it was more a, uh, an agreement uh, uh, signed off, I would say under duress in, in the way the uh, system was designed. But uh, going through that process, you then have this, um, uh, the, the additional element, which was the site for its cultural and spiritual values was also found to have uh, deep-rooted ancient scientific values. And so having the, um, 
the approvals in place uh, meant that uh, there were no checks and balances to review uh, those approvals and therefore the uh, project uh, proceeded to destroy that site. Now, I've been in discussions in recent days with uh, a number of parties around the, uh, well, particularly this matter that we're bringing to you today, um, which basically says, and you know, the, the imagery that uh, I've been uh, trying to grapple with is this idea that here the company BHP has uh, pretty much all the all the um, approvals, and the imagery I've been sharing is it's like having a loaded gun to the temple with uh, you know finger on the trigger, and then saying, okay, well. We won't pull the trigger subject to signing these uh, documents, um, but uh, we reserve the right uh, to pull the trigger. And that's the, uh, the concern uh, I, as a Aboriginal person, a traditional owner and a cultural activist, cultural leader, am looking at it and saying, well, this is not, not good enough. The, uh, cultural heritage uh, of our, you know, our space, but also of all Australians and all humanity is constantly diminished each time uh, one of these important sacred places are, are destroyed. And just because the laws are written in such a way that uphold the uh, extraction of those resources, it still doesn't make it right. And so the um, the idea of a moratorium, uh, which is to, uh, it's not a moratorium on mining, uh, you know, continue to do the activities that uh, you're currently engaged in. But what we're really seeking is a moratorium on uh, pulling the trigger. Um, show a bit of good faith, show a bit of goodwill, and come back to the Aboriginal people and say, hey you guys no we will not pull the trigger uh we will demonstrate leadership in the industry go into a moratorium on all future damage because this is what we're looking for we're actually looking for leadership from within the industry um since bhp got the approvals for uh south flank uh there have been 34 other section 18 approvals in western australia uh, potentially amass, uh, amounting to hundreds of Aboriginal sites to be destroyed. So the real question here is what has changed? Um, and at the moment there's discussions around, oh yes, we're, we're going to set up a heritage council, we're going to um, enter into some forms of agreements, but it's actually agreements that got us into this, uh, into this bind, into this problem. And so there is an opportunity there to demonstrate leadership, bring a moratorium, and buy some uh, breathing space so that uh, the company is saying, we will, no we will not act upon uh, the, the permitting that we have to destroy these sites. We will sit down and talk with the traditional owners, get their consent, and uh, or if, if not their consent, then let's work out uh, an alternative approach. And I think that's essentially what uh, people are looking for. Um, there's a tremendous opportunity here for you as the shareholders to actually uh, do something unprecedented, I think in, uh, in corporate history in this space, which is to send a clear message back to say, in the leadership of our business, of our company, we want to ensure that things are done right. We want to buy, borrow the time to uh, have that opportunity to talk. Um, and there's a great opportunity here for BHP and industry to uh, work with Aboriginal people to then also re, um, recast or rebuild uh, the legislative uh, arena so that cultural landscapes are protected, cultural values um, are enhanced, and uh, these important places of uh, 
immense spiritual, cultural, and also scientific values are not lost uh, in an incremental, accumulative, or straight out uh, bombing experiences with uh, experience with Jukun Gorge. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I could go on all night, but uh, I don't particularly want to be here all night. And I think uh, some of you may also feel similar sentiments. Thank you so much, um, Kato. Uh, so uh, the uh, only things to add, so um, it's a very hard act to follow, Kato, I must say. Um, but um, just, just to say that, um, so we've asked for three things in the resolution. The, the first is a moratorium, and I think um, I can uh, add nothing to what Cato has said as to why that is important and um, the absolute, um, uh, the, the right request at the right time proportionate to what is at stake. Um, the, so that's in um, Clause A of the resolution. Clause B is around a commitment to the non-enforcement of any relevant contractual or other provisions that limit the ability of um, affected people, um, of traditional owners to speak publicly about their concerns. Um, and C is to disclose its expectations of its industry associations on, on their lobbying. And the industry associations, as we'll hear in um, uh, Dan and Ed's presentations, um, are uh, incredibly active and influential in the Australian policy environment. And so setting expectations, we think, is, is absolutely critical. Um, as to BHP's uh, responses to, to these three things, if we just um, go to the next slide, and I can already see that there are um, some people with their hands up. So I'll get through this very quickly so that you can ask um, questions of, of Cato. Um, but uh, so uh, BHP in their shareholder presentation yesterday um, and also in their uh, notice of, of, of meeting, um, they have said that um, the moratorium ask is, um, uh, you know, that we're that the that ACCR is proposing for BHP to take certain unilateral actions to override agreements uh, without consultation, with that it has an unintended consequence of disempowering Aboriginal traditional owner groups to manage their cultural heritage, um, and would override the recent agreement with the Banjama people to establish a heritage advisory council. Um, I will hand that over to to Cato in a moment. But um, and, and the, the only thing that I will say is from a legal perspective, a technical perspective, that is not correct. Um, so uh, the resolution, even if passed, um, would first of all have nothing to say at all about an agreement between BHP and the Banjama people to enter into a, um, a further consultative process through a Heritage Advisory Council in relation to South Flank. Um, it has nothing to say about that as well. Um, it, it, it is simply a, um, a request um, that, uh, that the board take these things into account. There is no uh, binding effect of, the, of this at all. Um, in relation to part B, um, while BHP has said um, that it's not required, they have now, as of last week, um, in a statement they uh, released on their website, but also the evidence that they gave to the parliamentary inquiry, they have uh, committed to do part B. So they have confirmed um, that they will release any relevant confidentiality uh, clauses, even though they say that it's not required here. Um, part C, uh, of course, we could uh, do with additional clarification um, of uh, BHP's expectations of its industry associations, but BHP has partially, again, committed to this. So really what we are talking about here is part A of the resolution, uh, a moratorium, as, as Cato says, on, on, on pulling the trigger. Um, so perhaps, Cato, if, if you would like to deal with, with that point, uh, a response to BHP's um, assertion uh, around, um, you know, disempowerment. It, it, it's the same, it's the same arguments that you can't, um, I mean, I don't want to be disrespectful, but you can't take, take that seriously. Um, because essentially the same argument is that uh, these agreements are empowering or have empowered people to make decisions uh, which the consequences have, have shown uh, don't necessarily uh, follow the, the uh, spirit of what those agreements were about. So, so yes, there, there is, um, and I have been 
talking on a uh, you know to to various people which I won't uh, mention whom but uh, you know there is great concern about uh, previous track records of BHP and um, having a uh, number of uh, processes and formal agreements in place but not actually following up and one of the big ones there of course is the keeping place uh, discussion both with Rio and BHP which is uh, there are literally uh, sea containers full of Aboriginal cultural material that have been extracted from um, sites that have been destroyed uh, in the past and there has always been this conversation uh, with the traditional owners about establishing a keeping place to uh, store these um, uh, these objects and artifacts uh, that basically tell the story of uh, human occupation of those lands uh, well into deep uh, time and that's still going on it's still ongoing so um, I think the clear message that everyone really wants is let's do a moratorium and use that as a basis from which we grow because it, the, these are unprecedented uh, times unprecedented events uh, we actually need a clear signal we don't we can't um, go back to having the confusion of um, uh, promises and on pieces of paper and all that sort of stuff so uh, coming through the you know from the floor of the shareholders meeting to have that clear direction um, will send a message not only within BHP but to also other companies and uh, across into uh, the public sector as well um, and I think that's really the expectation that Aboriginal people have it's not um, uh, you know platitudes around trying to protect our uh, you know our self-determination rights um, that's uh, that's actually quite um, offensive and uh, quite a uh, sham on the uh, on the uh, concept of self-determination so uh cato um i know these conversations are ongoing between the alliance uh, and bhp um is there any uh prospect of agreement for the agm um if so what would you know what what, what would bhp have to do you're on mute cato there we go i'm mute um there are conversations ongoing um, around the development of a uh, some guiding principles and uh, I think there, there seems to be some significant progress on that uh, between the Alliance and, um, and BHP. Uh, I think part of the challenge from the Alliance is to seek and get the endorsement of uh, membership groups uh you know back in on country and that's uh one of the challenges especially where some of the uh stakeholders or member groups are uh oh you know they're, they're basically um not very happy with the way things have been going or are going and are not sure that they can trust that the uh the guiding principles will deliver the outcomes that they have been seeking for all these times so uh, the answer is yes there is some conversation there is discussion at, uh, at those higher levels um, I'm not sure how that uh, will translate back onto the ground at this stage but uh, you know that, that is a conversation that ongoing we we do have a hand up um, Julia if if you're able to unmute yourself I hope that's not an accidental hand but to ask your question uh, sure thank you Brian can you hear me yes we can hear you fine Great. Uh, thank you Brian uh, thank you Kado uh, so my question is um, about engagement with the government uh, or local uh, governments uh, who grant those approvals um, I would assume that it's a more logical process to go into this before they grant all the permissions to exploit the deposits and essentially damage the sacred sites. So my question is uh, not exactly about whether uh, the First National does that. I'm sure you, you, you do engage with government. But the question is who bears the ultimate responsibility? Is it the, the government or is it the companies? And uh, how transparent is the process of granting those permissions does it involve dialogue with aboriginal communities uh and what role 
companies might be playing in, in this. Um, you know, are you suggesting that the process is not very transparent, that companies are kind of intensively lobbying uh, for these permissions being granted? So that my question is actually about the, the ultimate responsibility. Thank you. Mm, uh, good, thank you, Julie. Um, it, is, it is complex uh, because essentially Western Australia is a state that's primarily driven by you know the, the mining industry and the extraction of resources and therefore um, the machinery of government is built around expediting and making that as simple and easy as possible. Um, in the Aboriginal uh, heritage space the legislation we have is uh, was introduced in 1972 so it's well over uh, 40 years old. Um, the state government has committed to amending, not amending, bringing new legislation into effect. Um, and it goes some way to addressing the opportunity for uh, mutual in engagement. But as the laws stand at the moment, uh, there is no transparency. There is uh, uh, a process whereby um, the Aboriginal people can only access that by making uh, submissions to um, the, the, uh, the department or the minister. Uh, and what we've found in Western Australia to date that since 2010, there have been 463 uh, applications to destroy Aboriginal sites. And each single application may include up to 10, 15, or you know, one Aboriginal site. And of those 463 applications, all 463 have been approved since 2010. So you find that the, um, the machinery of government is designed to facilitate the, extraction, or the destruction of those sites for the purposes of extraction. And um, so the buck tends to stop uh, at the minister. The minister's the final decision maker. But uh, in a situation where the laws of the land are written to support the ongoing dispossession and marginalisation of Aboriginal people, um, you then start, you know, that, that's where the social licence comes into it and the conversation with uh, yourselves and with the, the corporate sector around, um, is it right that a multinational corporate citizen uh, should take advantage of marginalised, dispossessed uh, people in a first world nation um, because uh, the laws are written to their benefit. I hope that ex uh, explains the, the situation, Julia. Thanks, Cato. There are two more uh, questions in, in the chat um, and I'll ask them both. Um, at once and then um, you can deal with them however you like. The first is, uh, has there been any difference in the quality of community engagement among BHP, Rio Tinto and Fortescue Metals Group over the last three to five years? Um, and the second is, all uh, the miners are all aligned in their response to investors on confidentiality clauses. So the miners are all saying the same thing, um, that, that the confidentiality clauses are there to protect traditional owners, that they want to ensure appropriate confidentiality and don't want the detail of significant sites being publicly available. Um, BHP stated yesterday that no part of the agreements prevent them from making public statements. Can you touch on this? So first on the difference of um, between the, uh, among the companies and, and the second on the purpose of confidentiality clauses. So uh, Bryn, before you do go, the, the difference being a comparison between the three players? Yeah, has, ha, is there any difference in the way that um, the, the, those three major iron ore miners have approached um, Aboriginal community engagement over the last, last little while? Mm -hmm. I think FMG stands uh, stands alone in the in uh, among the three, um, having uh, openly uh, contested and uh, disputed um, uh, native title claims, and uh, uh, you know even uh, going to the High Court to speak 
Our Lady Top Determination overruled. So BHP and Rio uh, do, don't don't engage in that, that practice. They do become parties to uh, native title applications, and essentially, you know, they're not not wanting to uh, make it sound like it's uh, downplayed, but essentially, this is how the laws have have evolved. Um, so Rio Tinto was um, uh, a key player in basically shifting the attitude between um, industry engagement and Aboriginal peoples. Uh, when I was a young fellow starting out in this space, the top five Aboriginal disputes between the mining industry and um, Aboriginal people were basically CRA. Um, CRA, Hammersley Iron, which uh, all became Rio Tinto. So Rio Tinto did demonstrate a degree of leadership in uh, uh, coming on board with the recognition of native title in Australia. Um, BHP has sort of plotted along and mo moved through that uh, through that process. And where, where all this falls down is essentially in that... Um, in the two the two areas one is the uh the design of some of the illegal agreements and so by saying that you're actually protecting people that, that's you know sort of paternalism it's quite uh quite a quite paternalistic to be saying oh well yeah we'll, we'll put this clause in this agreement to stop people from talking because we're actually protecting you uh that just doesn't sound right uh especially when those clauses sort of deny uh the capacity of citizens to access, uh, um, you know, forums that uh, is available to all other citizens in the in the country. Um, the other side of this, though, is that the the leverage or the uh, the the uh, tool that's being used to silence uh, people is actually in the payment of uh, of compensation and. This is the big thing that's totally confusing in this whole space is that payments made by BHP, uh, Rio, FMG and other, other companies to Aboriginal people is actually uh, compensation for loss of land, for loss of uh, uh, cultural spaces uh, and, and all, all those elements of loss. But there's this ingrained um, uh, mentality within settler Australia that uh, refuses to accept that Aboriginal people may, uh, you know, manage money. And therefore they tie them up into all forms of uh, trust funds and uh, disbursement rules and um, and then the penalties. So it, it's sort of recasting a lot of these um, uh, payments into a uh, a, a favour or a privilege as opposed to a right. And so what then happens is that these Aboriginal people who are economically marginalised, socially marginalised, politically marginalised and uh, even life expectancy of, uh, you know, multiple years less than other Australians, then find themselves in a position where if they uh take a position, if they push back, then the corporates can refuse or hold, withhold payments, uh, payments of compensation money. And then that then sort of creates a situation where these marginalised, impoverished people are forced into a situation of, um, you know, basically into silence or interfere uh, for these types of retributions. And that's happening uh, on a on a daily regular basis. Was that the two questions or? Yeah, that was um that was the two. Um, there are three more, and and then I'll um I I think I'll I'll need to um bring an end to this part of the the conversation. Although I can imagine there there are so many more questions for you, Cato. Um, but the the three um, that are there, and I'll I'll read them all out. Um, and I've got a partial response to to one, a technical one, but I'll let you deal with the the um, the bulk of it. Um, so uh, the first is um, uh, 
can you please comment on the draft legislation um, from Western Australia? Is it on the right track and should shareholders hold any concerns? The second question is about the moratorium and, and, it, and it's about, so BHP, the question is BHP has undertaken to have a moratorium on section 18 sites and has also undertaken to renew and review conversations with Indigenous groups. Does that mean that part A of the resolution in practice is now no longer needed? Um, I'll respond very, very summarily to that in that um, BHP has not undertaken to, uh, in my understanding, to have a moratorium on Section 18 sites. Um, BHP knows that they're extremely vulnerable um, on South Flank, on the South Flank expansion, and they have undertaken to have further extensive consultations with the traditional owners. But um, in my understanding, they have not uh, under they have not um, undertaken to have a moratorium uh, on the terms that are, are pro proposed in this resolution uh, at all. Um, so there's a moratorium pending further consultation, not a moratorium pending consent. Um, so, uh, and then, so sorry, Cato, to um, get involved mm -hmm. there, but then the, the, the please deal with that as you see fit. Um, the third um, question is about Cato discusses a moratorium on pulling the trigger and for companies to look at alternative approaches to Indigenous cultural heritage. What does what do the alternatives look like and has these been have these been raised with BHP and are they open to them? Mm. I think ultimately the the alternatives oh was there a question on legislation to start off with or? There was. So is, is the um, uh, draft legislation um, uh, sufficient and should uh, shareholders have any concerns? Mm -hmm. I think ultimately the, the, the values of free, prior and informed consent, which uh, essentially um, allows for Aboriginal people to have that consent. Uh, the legislation as it's presented, uh, everything, you know, or not everything, but it, a lot of it looks fine, except when you get to the uh, final decision making and there is no capacity for consent, uh, decisions are imposed. And uh, so that, you know, that, that's the deal breaker. It basically goes back to saying, well, yes, uh, and, you know, the, the implications, of course, for companies like BHP and others is that it probably then creates a expensive uh, process um, of having consultations, uh, engagements and all that sort of uh, those processes uh, to get to a point where uh, decisions are then made by the minister which people will be forced to appeal and, uh, and fight. And so uh, the ideal situation is one where the parties do get together and I think that's where BHP was uh, alluding to in trying to set up the Heritage Council and, uh, and others is to have those full frank uh, conversations but they really need to be conversations at the level that um, uh, effectively act free prior and informed consent um, and not uh, dressed up as um, consultation uh, for an outcome that's already predetermined. So that, that's the end, uh, I suppose, my best answer to that question. You'll have to remind me of the other two, Bryn. Uh, so the question was, what does the um, alternative look like? That's, that's the last one. Yeah, yeah, well, the, the alternative is, um, and th th this is essentially, I think, what we're calling for is, let's have a moratorium, um, and it's a moratorium on destruction. So no, no more destruction and then sit down and work through with the traditional owners um, in uh, a spirit of uh, seeking and ultimately uh, securing consent um, in a way that uh, is respectful, that does, uh, that does address uh, and, you know, uh, address the fact that the consent is genuine, the consent is uh, built on uh, being informed and it's, it's free, so there's no duress. Um, so uh, I think the opportunity is still there. I think the company is in a position to, to demonstrate leadership there 
Um, the first step though is just to get that moratorium. It's basically a, um, it's like a headline, headline uh, uh, item. And from that, you then build out. So, you know, that this, this is the thing, it's, it's a circuit breaker. It's this um, issue where there's this uh, traumatic events. Uh, we need to get the, the cleansing, in our language we call it Ngabitika, um, which is basically, uh, you know, the, the repayment, uh, the cleansing. And then the fact of the matter is that Aboriginal people want to work with BHP. They want to work and uh, come to an agreement um, in my area where I um, uh, come from. I'm a native title holder uh, with the uh, Mount Keith and Yakabindi uh, Linster nickel mines, uh, which are BHP projects. Um, I don't necessarily agree with uh, some of the things that were going on, but I think there's BHP has built some relationships with my native title claim group, which uh, uh, is is actually making a difference in the lives of people in my community. We've got young people who, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, were uh, stealing cars, getting into jail, um, but they're now engaged in working with BHP uh, at these at these mine sites. So, you know, there is that goodwill there, um, but I think the circuit breaker needs to be, let's do the moratorium, let's clear that space, and then we can uh, embark on a journey together and rebuild relationships from the ground up. Cato, and, and thank you. Uh, thank you to Cato, thank you to Ed, thank you to everyone who um, has joined us and asked questions tonight. Um, if you do have any follow-ups, please email us. Um, it's brin at accr.org.au or dan at accr.org.au. Uh, we'll get back to you, um, but uh, obviously we we absolutely encourage you to um, support the uh, support the shareholder resolutions that we we have put. We think they're on really important issues, and it's obviously in the um, in our view um, in the interests of shareholders to um, send a strong signal to to the board. Uh, so uh, thanks again, um, and we will leave you for now. Um, uh, good night.